Hi, my name is Catherine Samputa, and I'm here to present about my research I do at MTSU. And so my research focuses on two proteins and their importance in a stress response. And this is just like a picture of robotic C. elegans. Um, some engineering folks decided that they wanted to test out and um, just do like their muscle systems, and they made a little uh, robotic uh, replica of C. elegans, which is a worm. And so I'm going to go over the two proteins, which is called, or they're called uh, ubiquitin and proteasome. Go over some previous findings, you know, do a general presentation summary, and then go over questions. So, <clears throat> how do cells identify damaged proteins that need to be destroyed within the body? And so uh, the answer to this is that they use a 76 amino acid um, protein to tag those damaged proteins. And so the big question is, like, why do we even care if damaged proteins are tagged anyway in the body? Well, this is because of something called, um, you want to be able to regulate proteins. You want to be able to make proteins. You want to be able to destroy the proteins that are old and damaged. <clears throat> and so again, talking about this protein here, this is a damaged protein. And so ubiquitin will come on and bind here. And so it binds onto the damaged protein. And so there's one of two methods um, that this protein can be destroyed, one of which could be autophagy, or the other which could be done by another protein complex, which is called proteasome. And so what happens is, proteasome here recognizes this whole complex from this, I guess, dark blue cap to this other dark blue cap is this whole uh, complex. And what happens is ubiquitin, then proteasome senses ubiquitin, and what happens is it starts to unbind this damaged protein, feeds it through this proteasome, Proteasome has a cap, a top cap and a bottom cap, and then it has these four rings. These two inner rings do the actual cutting of the protein. And then what happens is the ubiquitin that was bound here becomes unbound, repeats the whole process all over again, and then the protein that, um, that it left here, the proteasome then destroys by cutting it up. And so I told you the two, protein, um, two proteins I'm interested in, which is ubiquitin and proteasome, the tagging and the destroying these damaged proteins. So now I want to go over what kind of model in our lab that we use. And we use something called C. elegans. And they are tiny worms. Yeah, they can't be really seen with the naked eye. You have to use a microscope to see them. And most of our worms have these bright fluorescent tags that we are able to see them in a microscope with. And so I have one worm strain that has a tag on ubiquitin. And I have another worm strain that has a tag just on proteasome. And the reason why we use this as a model organism is because they're very easy to manipulate. We're able to tag them. We're able to see them. And we can do this over and over again with however many worms, and their life cycle is very short. I can put just one on a plate, and in two days, I'll have the whole plate hundreds worth. One worm can lay 300 eggs within four days. And so you're just constantly having this, you know, re replicative ability of these organisms. And most, or most of these C. elegans are hermaphrodites, and there's very few males in the population, but, you know, they're able to basically one worm on a plate reproduce all by itself because it has both male and female reproductive organs. And then another thing is that they're very small. So I can have thousands of on, on them on plates and then stack many plates up and put them in an incubator and just have a ton of them. And so, <clears throat> so for my project, so now I told you about the proteins, I told you about the model organism which I study. So now my project focuses on both of these aspects. And so we noticed in lab that we had a worm and this is the ubiquitin worm that one has a tag on it and we cut it in half. We noticed that um, after a certain period of time, the ubiquitin that normally is very diffuse in the nucleus of a cell starts to relocate and form spheres in the gonad. And I'll show you pictures later and I'll describe this more, but I'm just kind of giving a general uh, feel of my project. And so we're seeing that there's some type of stress response on the, in this worm. Like So ubiquitin and proteasome are both responded by relocalizing structures in the nucleus to form these spheres. And we don't know what they are, we don't know what they're bound to, and this is kind of where my project comes into play. And so the big question is, what role does ubiquitin and proteasome have during this stress response? And so I'm going to kind of go over the ubiquitin strain, which I was talking about. Before I do that, I want to kind of do a little worm anatomy for you guys. And so this is a little worm, and this is a hermaphrodite, and so it has both uh, reproductive organs. This section here is enlarged. This whole U section here, until you get to the sperm section, this is, these are all eggs. Those are all hundreds and hundreds of eggs that are developing. The ones that are down here, starting at this negative region, these are very mature eggs. This egg here, this negative one, will go into something called the spermatheca. The sperm will fertilize it, 
and then it'll get passed on here and then be laid and then they'll uh, grow. And so um, I had to do kind of previous study and findings to figure out in both my strains. Just because I have a strain that has tags in both of these, I don't know if they'll um, you know, be representative of both strains or not. And so here is this Pachytene region, and this is the region that I'm going to focus on in both of my strains, so ubiquitin and proteasome strain, because this is the strain, this, these are oocytes that are young. They're both um, acting the same way in my, both my strains, ubiquitin and proteasome strain. And so this is just like normal DIC. This is what you see underneath the scope. I just kind of wanted to show you, this is the counting of the mature oocytes to kind of the unmature ones, and this is the area which I'm kind of focusing in on. And so um, here we have these mature oocytes, which these are really big. All of this is tag ubiquitin. So it's, like I said earlier, it's diffuse within the nucleus. This really dark center here is called the nucleolus. And so as you further get down here, you'll get these smaller um, uh, oocytes, which are eggs, and you'll have like, kind of like a big nucleus in the middle. And so this is at time point zero. You don't see any kind of spheres within any of these eggs. But when you look after 50 minutes, you notice that here, this is just, this right here is just one egg and it has many spheres that are forming in it. So instead of being diffuse all around it, they're starting to form tiny spheres in it. <clears throat> and so this is at it with ubiquitin. So now I'm going to show you what proteasome looks like. And so at time zero, you'll see here, you'll see like uh, the proteasome diffuse around the nucleus. You see the big nucleolus in the middle. But then at time, uh, at 50 minutes, you notice that just in one of these eggs, you'll see these spheres start forming. So this, again, proteasome is relocalizing. <clears throat> so I showed you guys that this occurs in my worms that I put tags on, correct? Well, I don't know if these actually form in the worms that you find outside. So there's a wild type worms that have no kind of tags in it. They have, you know, haven't been touched or altered in any way. And so I want to make sure that these do the same thing. So I want to know if this is something that really happens or is this something just because, you know, man messed with worm, thus there's some type of response. And so to do that, I did a technique called antibody staining detect just endogenous, regular ubiquitin or, and proteasome inside a worm after the stress has already been applied. And so here it's kind of hard to detect. Um, it looks way better on the screen. But all this is like one gigantic gonad. This is the Pachytene region. Each of these blue dots that you probably can make out are uh, individual um, uh, eggs, and that's just the DNA. Um, what's supposed to be here is supposed to be red in between. And that's just the gonad, which is supposed to show you the proteasome st la um, staining. At time point 50, this will be able to see a little better. So this region is the Pachytene region. And this is just one egg I pointed out that's showing that after 50 minutes of a stress being applied, you can see that spheres are, are forming. So this shows true for a proteasome. And then if you look at ubiquitin, spheres start forming here inside of an egg. So it's showing both spheres of ubiquitin and spheres in proteasome that are forming when a stressor is um, there. And this is also a mature egg that you can see. And then you can see that there's a sphere here forming after 50 minutes after a stressor. And so presentation summary, the big picture is that I want to know how ubiquitin and proteasome are involved in the stress response. And also what we already know is that when stress is applied to a worm, they create spheres. They relocalize this ubiquitin and proteasome to form spheres. <clears throat> we don't know why, so they're tagging something, they're destroying something, we don't really know what's going on yet. And then um, we, we know that ubiquitin and proteasome are both involved in this process at the same time. And then this kind of concludes my presentation. Any questions? Yes? So, I've, I've been doing research um, as of now. I've, I've been doing a lot of characterization, so I've noticed that not just cutting a worm, but um, high salt causes, causes these spheres. Other type of stressors like starvation causes spheres. <clears throat> so we kind of you know, went into that. So now our, our goal is to work with protein work now to see maybe what uh, proteasome is binding, like not proteasome, but ubiquitin is binding to. So doing maybe an IP assay to pull some stuff, you know, pull down that ubiquitin and see what other kind of proteins are associated with it. So, but it looks, uh, it could just be the images that I'm seeing, but it seems like that the, 
the quantity is different, but that it's just it's there or it's not there. Is that what you were looking for? See what I mean? No, I understand. Yeah. So I actually had like a, a bigger slide that showed each of the time scales, which went from zero to <clears throat> sixty, uh, zero to sixty, and it had each one of those. And at each one, you can tell that. Um, let me go back here. Because here, here is at 50 minutes, and it shows numerous amounts. But if you look at a live specimen, it looks different because when you're looking through the scope, <clears throat> the scope I look at goes through layers of the worm. And so you, sometimes you can see a ton that are there, and then sometimes you know you can't really see exactly what part of the worm. So you don't always just see them there. Like as here, everything was flattened out, and you're able to look at the worm um, closer. But there, there's a slight difference between ubiquitin and proteasome. Uh, I can't say statistically. Significantly, significantly significant, statistically significant, <laughs> or not <laughs> yet. So we're still doing uh, numbers on that. So, and that's my end of my presentation. Anything else? Questions? Okay, as a high school student, um, my 18 class can understand everything that you're saying, but as a general biology student. Can you help me make sense of your project as to why is your project important? Like how can that how can you relate that to me for me to actually hear about it? So there's these spheres that are forming. So there's some type of <clears throat> these protein spheres that are forming. Um, and it, it could be that maybe ubiquitin is ta you know, tagging on to maybe some unfolded protein that chaperones can't rescue. So like the Alzheimer disease where you have like proteins that can't fold properly and it's causing some type of problem. So there, there are diseases that are associated with, with, with like clusters of proteins that are gathering because if there's so many you know, clusters that are gathering, it, it might cause um, future problems with the organism. So I did a recovery experiment um, last week and I noticed that I, I did the same experiment and I tried doing a recovery with them. So instead of putting them like in a high salt, so I induced the spheres, I put them in like M9 buffers where they can just wash all that off and see if they can just survive with it. And at different concentrations, they died. And so this might be something that is lethal, but you know, this is just something like I did a preliminary experiment with to show it. So I have to actually go back and to see if it really was recovered or not, or if this is something that could be detrimental to the organism. What proteins do you think they would want to be getting rid of? I mean, it, logically it seems like, okay, if I've been cut or if I've been put into high salt, I need to be producing a protein to help me get past that barrier. This is true. So <clears throat> this is kind of a question for these worms. Like, So if a worm's cut, like the main driving force of an organism is that you want to, you know, you want to live, survive, produce organisms. but if this is cut and you got the reproductive part that's, you know, been cut in half, because this is what I'm doing, the whole entire reproductive half is, is being expelled. And it, it might be that they're trying to maybe tag proteins and destroy proteins so that the cell can further utilize maybe some of that uh, other components in there to, to maybe sur keep the cell living, maybe to mm -hmm, maybe survive onwards. So, again, I really don't know yet, but... <laughs> I'm just now starting my first year in the MOBI program. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. There we go. Ooh. So, a little bit of a disclaimer on mine. Don't take it condescending. Um, it was supposed to be aimed for a high school classroom, so that's what I aimed it for. Um, after being in Mr. Taylor's class and dealing with um, just some normal general biology students, I realized that some of the students didn't really realize what bacteria are or, or, or what they do and things like that. So I took a step back and I, oh, thank you. And I really just kind of started from the beginning.